Hey friends, Dean here. Before we get you on to your episode, I want to take a moment to invite you to our next virtual online trivia night. Wednesday, May 13th at 8 p.m. Join us either on our Facebook group or on our YouTube page for three rounds of fun trivia, music questions, movie questions, general knowledge questions. It'll be a fun time and a chance to win some prizes and have just a good relaxing night uh, of some trivia at, at home. You don't even have to go out for it. So don't forget, Wednesday, March 13th at 8 p.m., Join us on our Facebook group or YouTube for three rounds of fun virtual online trivia. We'll see you there. In this episode, join us in the quest for the stuff that dreams are made of as we celebrate the film noir classic, The Maltese Falcon. Stay with us. Get ready for the 3324 Podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Coover share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome to the 3324 Podcast. If you are new, have a seat. We appreciate you checking us out. Stay a while. And if you're returning, welcome back. We've missed you. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. We're also very active on social media. So do us a favor. Give us the follow on Facebook or Instagram at 3324podcast. It's it's free, right, Eric? It doesn't cost anything. That's right. Right? We're, we're giving yep. away the likes and the follows on Instagram mm -hmm. and, and Facebook. So go do that. And we would appreciate it. So you are here at the 3324 Podcast. You found us. I'm Dean behind the microphone. We've also got Eric at the other mic. Hello. How you doing out there? No one answered. No one answered. No, I didn't hear anybody answer after you said but, that. But uh, we... They're out there. <laughs> <laughs> They're out there. We know it. We know you're out there. We, we appreciate you tuning in. So here we go. We are doing, uh, you know, we, I, I say a lot... We, I throw that word a lot, you know, classic among classics. Well, this one really uh, is is that this defines classic among classics. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't seen this film, we're really going to strongly make the case for you to see it. Um, and this is the, the Maltese Falcon. And, Absolutely. Uh, um, we're going to I'm just going to apologize right now. If, uh -oh. Dean and I, if Dean and I gush over this movie. It, it it's because we love it so much. It's we're, this is one of those movies that we both are are totally equal on, no doubt about it. So yeah, here we go. Yeah, Let's this talk is... about the Black Bird. <laughs> you know what? Let me let me give before we get to the Black Bird. Let me give you a little a, a little prehistory too about how important how important this film is to me because we're talking maybe I think over I think ten years ago. I had originally fooled around with the idea of doing a podcast about films. So we're talking like 2011, maybe 2012, somewhere in there. I think 2011. Um, fooled around with, with doing, doing a podcast of my own about films. And so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to kind of record, record a, uh, an episode and see how it comes out. This was the movie I chose to do. Okay. Now, that is in the vault, locked away, because I... I kind of stopped halfway through, but, but the Maltese Falcon was the first thing uh, I thought of. And, and when we were also talking about what kind of content we wanted to do as far as music and movies, and, and we're throwing out like, you know, all the, the chestnuts that everybody knows, Maltese Falcon was like first on the list. Yeah. So it still is. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this is just uh, an amazing film. Um, film school, film school 101 is in session. So let's get into it. Came out in 1941. Screenplay written by slash directed by John Huston. Um, this would be his first film as a director. Well, he was already an established screenwriter, but an un, uh, an unknown quantity as a director, and that'll come into play uh, a little a little further down when we talk about casting. Right. Mm -hmm. This yes. is based on the book by Dashiell Hammett, which that book came out in 1930, and there was. We'll get to the film versions too. Okay. We'll just stay with the movie. <laughs> so much I want to get into. Um, nominated for three Oscars. Well, the shield. Let's go talk a little bit. Of... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll, mm -hmm. go, let's go through this and then go we'll, 
We'll we'll nope. we'll roll through. Go so ahead. Let's get, let's get through all <laughs> the ahead. technical. Yeah, we'll do all the technical specs. Then we'll just it'll go off the rails all after right. that. So this is probably going to be the only part that has any That's structure. Right. Um, nominated for three Oscars: okay. Best Picture, uh, Best Supporting Actor, Sydney Sydney Greenstreet, and Best Screenplay. Okay, uh, budget of three hundred seventy five thousand dollars. And it made 1.8 million. So that's that's a you know decent pocket money. Uh, that's a good return on the investment, I think. Mm-hmm. The cast. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm just gonna go over the. There's there's really in my book five main characters. Um, I, you have Humphrey Bogart. Okay, and this was really his first A list like leading starring role. You've got Mary Astor. That's right. Who a lot of people may not know. Back then, Mary Astor was a hot commodity, uh, very much in demand. Not not someone you you hear about too much now when you talk about the Hollywood Golden Age, uh, Peter Laurie, and this would be his his film debut for Warner Brothers. Uh, he had done some other stuff previous to that, and and was did a lot of work in Germany and then left. Um, Sydney Greenstreet, who uh, at the age of sixty one, makes his feature film debut in this movie, and yeah, what a debut! What a deb- What a debut! Absolutely, he was a, a theater actor. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So up he wasn't just point. like off yep. the street. He he, he yeah. wasn't. Actor, no, he's been he act, he's been acting well pretty much for quite a while. But this was yeah. his first. Yeah, he wasn't first a thing film, behind the camera. Yep, wasn't a film actor. So he made a. Uh, he came late to the game, but but God, I'm so glad he he got here when he did. <laughs> yeah. Um. And then finally, one of my personal favorites is Jerome Cowan, and he plays Miles Archer. He's not in it very much, but Jerome Cowan is one of those guys. If you've watched like TCM, like Turner Classic Movies, or you watch any of that stuff, he's always there. He's He was in over 100 films, Jerome Cowan. And he's like one of those supporting actors that you just see, notably mainly known for this role and Miracle on 34th Street, where he was the prosecutor that was that was prosecuting Santa in Miracle on 34th Street. That's uh, right. Mara. <laughs> they had yep. the thankless job of, of yep. going to Santa Claus, and then they they, they called his son, Donald, uh, not Donald, uh, whatever Mara Jr. And that's, that's the son comes yeah. up to, to testify. He's like, hi daddy. Um, hi, so that was, hi <laughs> daddy. <laughs> Bye daddy. Daddy would, <laughs> daddy would never tell a lie. So that, that's, that was Jerome. That's right. He's always in like that, that kind yeah. of, that those kind of roles, but I just love him. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, brief history. So the, the book came out uh, by Dashiell Hammett with, with the character Sam Spade in 1930, 1931. They are, they made a film version. So this was, you know, the book was well received and they really just knocked out a, knocked out a a film version of it. um, Very close to the, very close to the, to the book. uh, Very faithful. Then in 1936, they, they took another crack at the film, but they rewrote it and it was called Satan Met a Lady and it was with Betty Davis. Um, Horrible. Absolutely. But really just, (laughs) yeah, it was almost like a, the Goonies version of like, you know, of, of, of Maltese Falcon, even, even Betty yeah. Davis did not want to do this film. She's like, this is just junk. And they told her, Oh, yeah. I'll do this. And we'll not give you, uh, we'll give you better stuff. So it was really kind of goofy. They rewrote a lot of the characters just really did. It wasn't even a, a Falcon in mm-hmm. it. It was a horn. So that you could barely had any, any, any DNA shared. Yeah, it. it was, it was lighthearted. It was more of a comedy really. It was, you know, yeah, yeah. It was just sort of, it did. It, it got really goofy by the end of it. You're just kind of like, what? You know, his, it does not resemble the, the you know, the, the book in any way, shape or form. Well, there are times to charm, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, but Dash, let's get back. Getting back to Dashiell Hammett, though. I mean, he had, you know, himself. The story was broken up into like a pulp magazine and over over a course of, I think, three volumes, I, I believe. And uh, and then the finished product came out. And then but he was a Pinkerton. He was a, he was a detective. So a lot of what he wrote in the book was, was real, was, was like the real, what he saw as the real, the real deal. That's why the, you know, the story is so rich. And some, some were based on, on kind of characters he, he met in during his time there. Some were uh, imaginings of like what a, what a really, what a, what detective, what private detectives thought they were when they looked in the mirror, but not really. That's right. So yeah, this is really kind of steeped in, steeped in, he was steeped in it. So he, you know, there's no one better to kind of tackle this. And then we come to, to John Huston, who was kind of, yeah, knocking around uh, Hollywood as a screenwriter, did a lot of great, a lot of popular films too. I mean, his, he wrote a lot of, uh, a lot of big movies, finally get, gets an opportunity to direct a film 
and it's it's the Maltese Falcon. I, I think the thing, I think the job that actually cemented him into getting into doing Maltese Falcon was his work on High Sierra, which was a film that was I think it was right before mm-hmm. Maltese Falcon, with, and Humphrey Bogart was the lead in that. And but he up to this point, Bogey was playing a lot of heavies. He was, and even in this particular story, he was still a criminal on the lam. But I think what what happened was was that uh, he wrote such a, a, a richness to Bogey's character that you got you you felt sympathy for the guy. You, he was much much deeper than what he was used to playing. Usually getting killed off by Cagney or something, you know, in the earlier yeah, films. Him, him, Always Bo- <laughs> Bogey and Cagney had a kind yeah. of a, a, a they were like a yin and a yang. I mean, they were yeah. even in, in Oklahoma Kid together, which was like the only what like Cagney in a western. What? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> Cagney was that's in a western. Right. But, you know, one of my favorites, Angels with Dirty Faces, where where Cagney was was then the leading man and, and Bogart was kind of minor leaguing as mm-hmm. as like you said, the, the heavy or the, the the bad guy to Cagney's wor- even sometimes worse bad guy. But Cagney was the star and, and, and kind of Bogart was just kind of treading. I mean, in 1937, Bogart did like seven films, uh, but those are all those like those small roles that they get that you kind of knock out really quick. And because of the, you know, like I said, because of High Sierra, I think, you know, he wanted Bog when he got the job as director for Maltese Falcon, um, he wanted Bogart in the role. But, but the studio wanted George Raft. Yes. And uh, who was George Raft this- isn't, is another one who's not a giant. He is a giant name back then, but he, but he's not really remembered now. I mean, it's kind of like you, you think of Bogart, you think of Cagney, you think of Clark Gable, you think of Cary Grant. Uh, so many other really bigger, bigger names. But George Raft was was a, a leading man, like the guy, like what Bogart would eventually become is what George Raft already was. Yeah. Right. Yep. And uh, yeah. And he turned it down. He did. And, you know, much to I'm going to do my worst John Houston impression. Oh, boy. Watch out. Watch out. Much okay. to his delight. <laughs> he casted Bogart, you know, with the, with the with the cigar, you know, just love like hearing the guy talk. But they became really good friends, yeah. Houston, and it would it would be the start of a lasting relationship. The reason why George Raft turned it down is because he didn't want to work with a first time director. He's like mm-hmm. this this guy's inexperienced. I'm I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And we talk of it, it comes up time and time and time and time again on this show about those those choices and those weird decisions that change history. And this is another one of those. Mm-hmm. Is George Raft turning down this film, allowing Bogart to really kind of this this made him into the leading man that he would become and this kind of this was his breakout role yeah, and this kind of yeah. became the character he be, yep. you know the, most of his other films kind of took this mold for in one form or another yeah. they were able to to kind of build off of this performance so mm-hmm. so yeah and and Houston just just a little a little more behind the scenes with Houston uh he shot the film in order um which doesn't happen too often but he he over prepared. He basically, you know, kind of storyboard drawings. He he had everything ready for his his feature fa- film debut as a, as a director, and just was really over prepared, which helped the actors, you know, have have a, a firm grasp on what they were doing, and and probably helped him because since he did film it in order, he was just able to go right through um, the whole script. That's right, and the script itself, I think, you know, I think it was the the, the, the because it was so strong. And so faithful to the book, it was almost they say almost verbatim. Yeah, a lot of lines just came right out of the book, and that was his. That was his man. He was like, "I'm going to film the book." Yeah, and and he did. It's one of the greatest adaptations of of any written source. Yeah, I think you know. So and and, and there's so <clears throat> there's so much to there's so much to to really digest. And even watching it again, I, I'm, mm-hmm. I, caught, I caught even more, you know, it's just like, I love it. And then just, just to wrap up the, the kind of history part, th- this did really well, right? Three, three Academy Award nominations. There was a sequel that was planned at, at, in 1942, but it was never made. Mm-hmm. They never got around to it. Um, and, and it would, its influence would, would be felt um, well into the seventies. There was a movie called the black bird, and they would kind of do remakes and, and, in, you know, it influenced a lot of films. Sure. Um, yep. And then we'll get to, uh, we'll get to the Ren and Stimpy connection at the end. Well, how did you, well, let me ask you, how did you first come to Maltese Falcon? When, when was the first time you. Oh, later, later than you. I can tell you that much. Mm-hmm. I can tell you that much. It was, it was one of those ones that was, I, I was big into, I was like on a, a, the Cagney kick. 
Yes, so for I me, it was like yep. kind of like angels with dirty faces, and <laughs> that's right. Yeah, um, you know, like White Heat and and all those those types of films, at Yankee Doodle Dandy. So anything that Cagney was doing, I was really kind of like mm-hmm. focused in on him. So Vorgart was there in in some of those movies as as like the side guy. Um, and then I, I don't, I actually can't tell you. I don't know if I if I remember exactly when it was, but I I maybe I caught it on TCM or something, and I was like wow mm-hmm. like you hear about the maltese falcon you know, oh yeah it's one of those movies but you, you gotta watch it you know and then i got to see it at, at the alamo draft house they they screened it you know in the theater and i was absolutely there yeah. i was like i have to see this in the theater and and the and the people that were there were going wild for it like they came in like ready to watch this they were laughing and just having a, having a great time with it uh and it was such a great experience but yeah, i think you were i think it, you were before. it is Oh, I was I, I well, I came to it. Three movies actually got me into it. To be to be honest, it was a sort of stepping stone. And when you say that this movie had that kind of influence, you know, yeah, it, it Raiders of the Lost Ark when that came out, profound influence on that movie, and it's almost it introduced me to the what's called the MacGuffin in the film, which is the Falcon itself, this, the object that they're all searching for. So that's kind of similar to what was going on. And then there was a year later, Blade Runner came out. And I saw that and that had like that introduced me to this thing called film noir. It was kind of a mashup of sci-fi film noir, but it had that that sort of classic detective story feel to it. Filmed it on the back lot where they shot the Maltese Falcon even. So when they made the film, so that's a nice little piece of trivia there. And then the third would be uh, my dad had a copy of The African Queen which was another uh, Bogart-Houston collaboration a little later on, and that earned uh, Bogart's first uh, Academy Award for Best Actor mm-hmm. for that film. So I watched that, and I fell in love with that story. So, But that, you know, that was it. I was introduced to Bogart with that movie, but then I, that's when I got into Casablanca. I, I watched that. Yeah, and, I was, you know, was just going to say that. And, I, and, I think Casablanca also kind of casts a really big shadow. Yeah. Um, because it is such a big film. It is so much more renowned and it might you know uh, it might be better i I love casablanca as much or maybe even more i'm not sure like it depends on what mood you're in yeah they they both have a a certain sensibility to it that was ahead of its time and 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 everybody you know played against sam and and the post you know the the image of him and and, uh ingrid bergman it's so iconic that I think at that point it's like, well, Maltese Falcon was before that, and it kind of o- almost took a backseat because he he did one up himself with Casablanca. You can't right. you can't deny that he brought that whole type of character, the disillusioned yeah. you know guy type of thing, and and brought it to like the, Casablanca brought it to the next level, and that was the one that everybody remembers him for. So I think kind of he had a bigger film that came out afterwards. And that really is I think, cast a yeah, lot of shadow. I, I think that the thing that makes Casablanca might be might that level higher for me is is just the writing. Yeah. It has got to be the best written film of all time. Oh my time. god. You know, I mean Claude, the, the screenplay, Claude, Rains, Claude Rains in that film. Oh my god. The screenplay to that movie. <laughs> and it's original. It's an original yeah. based on an original play. So yeah. it's an original source, which I kind of like better than you know using an adaptation. But yeah. But again, it's it's it depends on your on your kind of mood too. It's just, you know, Casablanca is a little bit of sentiment to it. There's there's the the love story. There is the patriot. You know, I'm ready for you You know, <laughs> but but you, then you got Maltese Falcon, which is a lot more sardonic. It's like you know, and and, yeah. and, and cynical and just sort of hard boiled. But you know, so whatever mood you're in on the day, it's like yeah, I'll watch I'll watch both. You know, but yeah, it's like I, I, I the, you know the the difference between the two. I think also which which, which really is what kind of sets Maltese Falcon apart is pacing. Um, yeah. It's this, rapid this, fire. This, this, this is yep. one of the films. And I was funny. I was thinking about like the opposite. Who, what would the opposite of this be? This is kind of like the opposite of a Quentin Tarantino film. And what I mean by that is in the Maltese Falcon, there is not one wasted scene. There's not one scene that is, mm-hmm. that is there, that has, there are no scenes in there to have no point. Every scene in that, in that film has a point you're, you're getting in, you're getting into the scene when something is is happening and you're getting out after it happens. And mm-hmm. then you're moving on to the next thing. It's almost like breakneck speed, which keeps you kind of off, off kilter as well, because there are so many different threads that Sam Spade needs to manage and balance that, 
if you know yeah. it, it moves so quick that you almost can't it, it keeps you kind of a little di- like kind of disoriented of who's who's doing what what he's playing he's not playing both sides against the middle he's playing like five sides against the middle and he all and he has to manage this whole thing that's right and that's the brilliance of the book but it's it's the brilliance of executing that and putting it on film as well because if if you get somebody in the lead who overplays that it could it could very ter- very much become campy very quickly but because of Bogart's acting style which is kind of really low key and he actually was pretty expressive he did he would do a lot with his eyes and his face that and you wouldn't think that one of the keys yeah. to this movie i'll tell everybody now is one of the keys to this movie is you have to watch everybody's expressions because people are are doing things with their eyes and their expressions that that they may not have lines in the scene but there there's so much other stuff going on that it's just a delight to watch because people are giving each other the side eye and and looking at this one and and, and just right. giving a little grin or a smirk there's so much that goes that goes on that this movie just just delivers so but we're we're getting ahead as as, as predicted. And it all takes place <laughs> and it all takes place in indoors you know you go from one room to another just a bunch of people talking but that it's like an action movie right the dialogue i mean it's so it's so rapid fire it's it's just it's it's almost feels like an action movie but there hardly is any action in it yeah, you know, just very, very little. Is, is physical, ele- the, you know. the dialogue is electric in this film. It really is. Yeah, it, it, it's it's snappy. It, it's got some of that datedness, but I love that that datedness. Like the, you know, it, I just yeah. love it. It's just, it, it's, of course, it's and not, nobody it's not writes corny. like this anymore. Yeah, it's it's not corny. It, it really just moves. If people, so, try, yeah, if people try to write like that today, you get that campiness to it. You know, yeah, it you, comes you're, off you're as harkening a, as back a to that era. It's definitely of its time, but there's nothing like it. You know, and you can't yeah. duplicate it. You just can't. Yeah, no, so. absolutely. Because there's just so much, and there's so many different relationships. Let's just go. I'm just going to skim through the plot just quickly. Because if you haven't seen it, I mean, it's going to get ruined for you no matter what. But, you know, we're not going to go through the whole thing like that. <laughs> but basically, you know, there, there's detective agency Spade and Archer, which Samuel Spade is played by uh, Humphrey Bogart. Archer, Miles Archer is played by the great the great Jerome Cowan. And there, there's a little bit of, some, uh, you know, there's an underlying issue going on between them. Basically, Bogart was, was fooling around with, with his partner's wife. But yeah, he's he not a nice in the guy, story. Bogart himself. He's, he's not perfect. It's not that he's a <laughs> yeah. bad guy. He's, 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 no. as, has, he's as fallible as anybody else in this movie. And that's the thing is this movie is just filled with yeah. imperfect people to, to varying degrees, right, mm-hmm. of, of imperfection. Oh, that's so, right. Yeah, so th- so they get they I'll, they have I'll, a I'll I'll, I'll 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 I dare say that I'll this movie is you know he is not used to what he deals with with these people is not something that he normally he's always dealt with probably low lives that were probably much easier to deal with in the past in this in this movie I think he's really getting a run for his money with these characters so we'll we'll talk about that as we, oh yeah as we, no he absolutely you know, I mean th- yeah. it's there and that's the beauty is there's so much to manage as the as a character so beyond uh, you know the all the different characters he's interacting with his partner gets mm-hmm. killed so he's got to figure that out and then this mysterious woman comes into the office you know and and she's got something to do with it and then there then Peter Lorre comes into it as Joel Cairo it's a whole uh, and he brings a whole other sensibility to the movie See, that's the it's thing just, it's like he- his partner gets killed, but he doesn't, that's doesn't seem at the time to be the driving thing for him. He's in the beginning. It's like, he doesn't care. Like he's like, yeah, I, I you know, he, he's dead, but that doesn't seem to be what's driving him in this film. It, it seems to be, he's, he's getting involved in something and he's almost like he's a detective. But what I find I, ironic about it is like, he does very little detecting in the movie. You don't actually see him going through the procedural of him. Like, looking for clues and things like that. He's getting caught up in this, like, you know, and he's yeah, like, he's, he's, he's doing like, more people managing in this. Exactly. Like, like yeah. just trying to, trying to get, uh, he does do, de- he does detect though, because he does uh, it by uh, deception because the, the Mary Astor character who is uh, eventually her name after like three, two lies is, is Bridget O'Shaughnessy. Before that, it was Miss mm-hmm. LeBlanc, which should tell you right there that that's a lie blank. <laughs> um <laughs> So so he, he before meets that her it was and, Miss Miss Wonderlay. 
Miss Wonderly. So, it, and which, which, you know, when you, when you, when you first see her, that's when they become enamored with her. Wonderly, and then LeBlanc, and that, yeah, that's interesting. And then, that's, fi- that's then you finally get point. her real name. That's cool. Um, so yeah, so she comes into yeah. the office. She needs, she needs someone shadowed. Basically, she gives a whole story. I mean, she's the character's a professional liar. There, there's no end or no no end point to the amount of lying that she'll do and that's one of the the interesting things about this character is this is really you know i don't want to overuse the word film noir but this is widely regarded as the first film noir you know film noir there we go but -hmm. this character is just so flawed but is so used to getting her way through lying that bogart despite he he sees right through her and that's one of the great things about it despite mm-hmm. that he still does certain things he still falls in love with her but he falls in love with her with his eyes open and and she's not used to that because you know he he'll uncover yeah, one he, lie she she'll start she'll start a whole other line of lying and he'll be like that's bs as well and then she goes even another level down and he just he just doesn't believe anything yet he's still enamored with her and that's maybe right. that's what it is is that Normally, those well, she, surface she level thinks she's got are, him under you know under her yeah. spell. She is she she made she the, the mold was her. I mean, she was the ultimate femme fatale. You know, like others were just looking up to her at this after this film. Yeah, uh, Mary Astor is the ultimate femme fatale. The, I don't yeah. think there's anybody that could equal she, she plays, she her plays amount the of. <laughs> in, she plays the damsel in distress, that's right. like that. That's her. That's her stock and trade in, in the movie, and how she would get men to do things for her because she would play on her looks, and she would use that. You know, she would be able that's to right. give him a, a doe-eyed look, and and just which is what happened to Jerome Cowan's character. He totally got enamored with her. He didn't care about the case. He was like in the beginning. I, you know, uh, I. It was like you saw her first, but I said something is what is what Miles Archer says because and, and that's all he was. I mean, if you look at that scene when 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 Mary Astor when Jerome Cowan comes into the office, Miles Archer, he looks like a Tex Avery wolf, like from the cartoons. He's just like licking his chops. He's eyeballing her. So you have to watch like like these characters. He's just you know Bogart is neither one of them are fooled by her. And that's the thing. But but Miles is is fooled they're not fooled by her story, but, but Miles Archer is fooled by her, her looks. And he's, he's just over, just glossing over everything else and saying, well, this is going to be, you know, cause I'll, he thinks, well, the because he's, the, he's, a, he's normally the, a lady's man. So he thinks he can get any woman. So if this is her, his latest, you know, yep. uh, you know, victim, Conquest. so to speak. So, but uh, the table, the tables, the tables turn on him rather yeah. quickly. <laughs> Rather quickly, so he ends yeah. up getting shot. Yeah, um, that leads to to eventually meeting the Peter Laurie character, which is Joel Cairo, which is just one of those iconic. I think he's one of those iconic film film characters. He's just uh, mm-hmm. there, there's just something and, about him when he comes on the screen, and and his interactions with Bogart are just electric. It's just you know Bogart doesn't even know what to make of him in the beginning. It's like the you know he hands him the uh, Effie his his secretary hands him the business card and. He goes to like he he hands it, he holds it, and then he like catches a whiff, and she's like gardenias, and, <laughs> and he comes in, and this is a this um, is a a perfect piece of casting because you know Peter Lorre is used to playing these rather strange characters and 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 such, but in the book the character of Joel Cairo is um, openly homosexual. And, and and of course, with the censorship at the time, they really couldn't play it like that. So they kind of made him a little bit of a dandy. But but Laurie, I mean, he sells it. He's, you definitely can tell that he's, you know, there's no denying it, but it's not explicit. Yeah, because you know, they, so, they did have the, the right. film, the motion picture film had a uh, had a code that they enacted. So I, I believe the first version in 1930 actually did portray that a little bit more. But yeah, now that they had, a, they also wanted to tamp down the, the the drinking. But I think John Huston said you can't with the like like Sam Spade's a drinker like that. You can't have him just not drinking. So so there was some things that they had to work around and and, and kind of figure out. But yeah, Joel, Joel Cairo is just a, just th- their whole interaction when when they're first talking about the bird. Um, and th- and that's the thing is is that's where he's doing his detective though. It, it, detecting is because Spade isn't letting on that he has no clue what what Joel Cairo is talking about. And and that's being a detective is just playing along. Like he knows what, what he's talking about. Cause all of a sudden he hears about this black bird never had never heard about it up until this point, but totally plays it off. Yeah. You want me to find it? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, 
you know, mm-hmm. and that's when, it, and that's the first time that, yeah. uh, that, that Peter Laurie tries to hold him up, you know, he wants to search his office and, uh, it's it's the first of a few beatings that that Peter Laurie will get at the hand, and, and it leads to one of the greatest quotes later on. You know, it's because like, because he, 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 right. he, he, he there's a scene later on where where Bogart kind of hits him, uh, and Peter Laurie's like, you know, that's the second time you've laid hands on me, and and Bogart's like, when, when you're when slapped, you, you'll take when it you, and when like you're it. Slapped, you'll take it and like. <laughs> <laughs> and he lays like like three and rapid just, fire you like, know, slaps on him. It's just it's just it's right just on the chin, all, like, yeah, <laughs> uh, just it's it's got all this great stuff in it. And the, so the thing that's funny about that too is like Humphrey Bogart is not a big guy, okay, in real life. Like he was he's he's rather he wasn't a very tall man, and he's rather thin. So, but w- when you see him up against Peter Laurie, though, he's he towers above yeah, him. Like, Peter Laurie just, was <laughs> tiny, so that's about the only person. Him and Cagney you know, were the only ones you know. who could probably out, you know. <laughs> be out, out height yeah so it's just one of the, this is this is just one of those films where the the casting is, is spot on the delivery of the dialogue is just is just right there um so so they go through the you know the whole joel cairo thing um we get introduced to another character which we didn't really go over in in the beginning wilmer cook and he's basically like a he's kind of shadowing Bogart and following and, and he's kind of like a uh, an element of danger that they don't know about yet. He, they're kind of a, don't know what his, his game is, but he's kind of following Bogart. Bogart shakes him off once, but then uh, follows him again. Um, another, you know, and then Bogart goes to to find Joel Cairo after an evening of, of some police interaction, um, which is another great scene when when the police come to Bogart's house and he won't let him in because he's got Mary Esther and Joel Cairo in, in the other room. Uh, they're all trying to get together, find out who knows what. Um, and then they start fighting mm-hmm. and the cops come in uh, and, and they just have to try and figure, you know, talk their way out of it. And that's one of the scenes where you have to watch everybody's eyes and their expressions. Cause Bogart is just so that's right. Figuring out a what it's just he's so taking quick. it all in. Yeah. So quick to, to, and that's to the thing. It's like, you know, the story, <laughs> And that's the thing that there is no story yet. And that's the brilliant thing. It's, it's, she is lying to him so much. He has no idea what's going on, but we're introduced, slowly introduced to these characters. And that one by one, a little piece of the story is, is developing, you know? Yeah. Cause she and doesn't give him anything. He finds it. Informa- right. He, he exactly. finds information then comes and confronts her with it. And then she will come clean a little bit, but then still couch it in lies. That's right. And, and she knows and- she knows Peter Laurie's character. The, that's a great scene where they're both sitting there and they're talking amongst themselves. And and, and Bogart's just kind of like leaning that that one shot where he's like leaning in, you know, the close up on his face because he's listening to the con- their conversation. Because obviously she's re- there's a lot being revealed yeah. through this conversation about the bird and and you know like who's looking for it and that kind of thing. And he's just like, oh, well, you know. Yeah, it's great. It's just absolutely. Yeah, and then there's you know, the, where the um, where the 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 cops are, are you know the 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 main you know the main detective's like, oh, okay, haul them all in or whatever, and then he takes he takes a sh- he he gives like a rabbit punch to Bogart, and then Bogart falls back and he's about to go after 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 the the lead detective and Ward Bond who plays the other detective is like, no, Sam, no, like yeah, don't, like like don't. Don't take a swing because that's exactly what he wants. Because the, right. uh, the cops are basically after Bogart, and, and they allude to it a little bit later on when Bogart sees a, goes to see a lawyer or the, or the DA, and he said, you, you know, you tried to get me, in, you know, this, you know, my license taken away or whatever once before, and it didn't work. All you had was a good laugh. So, so there is some some animosity between certain cops. You know, they, they kind of don't really like him and. Which is typically, kind of, uh, which is typically the case in a, in a classic noir setting. You always have the the detective is somewhat somewhat seedy, somewhat shady, and the cops are and there's so there there is that sort of I wouldn't say competition, maybe I don't know. There's there's that sort of unhinged like they there is a relationship there, but it's it's kind of like they don't trust each other. Yeah, kind of thing, which is most of the time you know these that's why they become private detectives to begin with. They might have been cops at one mm-hmm. point. You know, but they come, you know, they do this on their own because they don't want to get tied up with the red tape and all yep. the, you know. So, yeah. So, yeah. so not only does Bogart have to deal with a woman that 
he might be in love with that is just uh, just lies about everything has not really told anything yeah uh then you have mysterious joel cairo who is talking about this blackbird and then you also have he's also dealing with the cops who know some of the stuff that Bo- bogart has told them lies and they've been able to prove it so he's not a he's not a reliable source of information to the police. So, so there's no doubt that why they're going to suspect that he had something to do with his partner's murder, because he is lying to the police and the, and the police are actually, they, they easily disprove one of his lies. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so he's got a lot that's going on and he, all he's trying to do, like, like Eric said, is he gets new information. He goes back to the, to his client <laughs> to find out more. And she just does nothing but lie. And she just, and, and yeah. kind of she's just trying to string it along and 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 like he said it he goes I, you know you can't just like hope this all comes out in the end and it all works out because and i don't think you know, and at this point i don't think he's used to this he's used to being like on top and one step ahead of everyone and and maybe he is maybe he isn't we don't know we are forewarned in the beginning when evie effie is telling him sam you know you're you sometimes you worry me because you're, you're too slick for your own good and in this and in this situation this really starts to play out you know, her, her little, her little warning to him. And, and, you know, cause who has the upper hand here who, you know, we, we don't know yet. So it's kind of like, it's at this point, it's so convoluted that you're, <laughs> you know, and that's what keeps you on the edge of your seat is, is watching these characters just sort of play this out. And yeah, that's and, and, and the, you know, the great thing about this film also is they didn't like just f- open the floodgates and introduce all these characters. So you get just some time with, with Mary Astor's character, Bridget That's O'Shaughnessy. right. So you get yeah. you get a really you you kind of get some interaction there. Then you get then they bring in Joel Cairo, right? And mm-hmm. and you get some you know then he's got a scene. Uh, Bogart has a scene with him, a couple of scenes with him, and then they put the three of them together, right? So mm-hmm. so they're they're kind of building on this whole thing. And then there's a there's a, another interested party that that Wilmer Cook, the guy that's been shadowing them, represents, and that's Casper uh, Gutman, and uh, that's played by the yeah. great, which uh, we Sidney haven't Greenstreet. met yet. We haven't Sydney met Green. yet. He's called the yeah, call him the fat man. Yet. The fat man. And in that, uh, that's in that conversation <laughs> between her and Joel Cairo. She goes, the fat man. And now it's like, okay, now we get a sense that this guy could be pulling the strings. You know, this could. You know, who is this other? Who is this gum? You know, this this uh, uh, this guy outside the window. Why is he tailing Bogart? Who is he? Who is he working for? We don't know this yet. And this yep. comes out in that in that conversation that I spoke of, the fat man. Yep. Who's the and, fat man? <laughs> Who's the fat man? You know, and, yeah. and it's it's Sidney you know. Green Street because he is a he is a yeah. a really a, a tall guy, but he's also a very big man too, and that's that's what he's the force uh, to be reckoned with. He is, and I he say that he could have been the kingpin if he was alive now in like a Marvel film. He would be the kingpin. Oh, there's no there's no <laughs> doubt about it that he is he is the model, the inspiration for Jabba the Hutt. There is no doubt about it <laughs> that Lucas Lucas yeah. would admit to this. And it, the brilliant thing is with the way Houston would would put the camera down below. So yeah, he's so looking he up at this bigger. guy's like bulk. So he is totally, you know, Jabba was, he's totally Casper Gusman. Got yeah. Me, no doubt about it. Yeah. So I think, so even, he's, even, I think Lucas even said, he goes, I want to put a fez on top of his head because the character he plays in <laughs> Casablanca. Yeah. And that didn't, that didn't happen. Ferrari. But, <laughs> yeah so <laughs> yeah so so now you get him in, in into the into the mix and, and yeah like eric said he he is the driving force he is the the force behind looking for this blackbird he has been on a quest for years to find it um mm-hmm. finally meets up with bogart and they have a conversation basically tells him the history of it so we get to find out exactly why this this bird is so important why the stakes are so high why are people getting killed because so far Two people have been killed as a result of all these events. So it's just, I I love his, I love talking to a man who loves talking to a man who loves to talk. <laughs> he, he's just, he's, he's yeah. just such a the great. Deliver- I can listen to this man talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, when he's talking to Bogart about the Falcon itself and he's, he's telling him what it is. I could listen to that for hours. Yeah. And he's telling him the entire history of where it came from, what it was, you know, you know, the, the whole thing. This isn't, you know, school book history, but history nonetheless. And it's not Mr. Wells history. You know, I love that stuff. Uh, it, it's just I, I, the delivery of it is so is so great. And you know, so, you, you know what? You know, kind of you're talking about Raiders. I think they may have taken another part of it, too, a little bit when um, when the two FBI agents go to meet. Uh, Indy and Marcus, and they talk about the they they kind of give the origin of the Ark, 
it, it kind of is That's like right. the same type of story a little bit like they're uh, you know kind of telling it in the same way um about the history of the no, arc there's no and, doubt and that it's, i think it's it, it's you know yeah. how it passed through time and, and he and the the story of the falcon is the same way and i, I kind of get that also from the scene with with where indy is in the in the cantina with with belloc the the villain and he's mm-hmm. then he's telling him there you know there's that exchange it's very maltese falcon right there you know so it's yeah. He's basically telling Indy, like, you're not, you know, you're not any better than I am, you know, just, you know, you think you are, but you're not kind of thing. And he's given a little bit of this and history. And so there's no doubt that this movie had such a profound influence on on Raiders. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so we we get to meet him and and he is basically the the money man. He's the guy behind the quest worked with worked with Joel Cairo Wilmer Cook the the guy that's been following Spade is is, is cut, basically now we find is like the hired gunman uh the gunsel that that is kind of just do, doesn't really say much but he's got a he's there's another great quote that comes out of it is uh what is it you know like uh, I think they're in the they, I think they're going in down the hallway to meet Casper Gutman I think the second the first time or the second time Mm-hmm. And and Wilmer's like you know keep keep on riding me and they're going to be picking iron out of your liver. I mean you can't write, like write stuff like that. It's like and then and then Spade comes back with yeah. you know, the, the cheaper the crook the gaudier the patter. So he he realized <laughs> like he acknowledges that that kind of stuff is just so hokey. Like like it's 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 tough guy talk, right? It's like you know they're going to be picking well, iron out of your well, liver. What about the scene in, in right? What about the scene where he's trailing in in, in, in the hotel lobby and he's sitting there and and, and Bogart just walks right up to him and he sees him sitting there. Yeah. And he's just, you know, acting like he's like, oh, I'm, I, I know what I'm doing, but he just sees right. Well, he's like, he sits off. down and he's just like, he's like, shove up because people lose teeth talking like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like so really, much great. And he calls dialogue. over. <laughs> so, so many yeah. quotable lines from this film. That that's one of the great things about this yeah. too is is just that the screen the screenwriting is just so great and so yeah. fitting fitting of this environment of this. Uh, you know, there is nobody that's you know, on, on, on any type of a uh, high moral ground in this film. So that you kind of yeah. getting a feeling for how these, how these people interact with each other. No one is above stabbing somebody else in the back to get what they want. And even Spade, because mm-hmm. Spade did it. He, he fooled around with his partner's wife. So again, there's no, no right. uh, equivalencies to be made as far as like who, who's better than the other, or everybody has some, some type of a bad side or a dark side. It's just to what level. You know, and and Spade is is managing his way through that, and he, so he meets with Gutman, and really, like Eric said, gets finds out what the deal is with this, and why people are dying over this this item, um, and what's so important about it. So he again, he's still just try, still get, gathering information and just trying to still figure out where all this fits. It's it's, you know, then he gets then he gets called, but you know, then he has to go see a lawyer because the lawyer is you know kind of bothering him. So there's a scene there where he's just being badgered by the lawyers and just saying, you know what? And that we, we talked about it earlier. It's just kind of like you try, you know, you tried to get me, you know, my, my license taken away once before it didn't work. Uh, you know, come, come subpoena me if you have something to say, cause I'm not saying anything else. There's definitely a lot of balls in the air. Like he's juggling a lot of stuff at the same time now, which is, which gives you the impression. Like I said, he, he's not used to this kind of case. I think, I think this, this is something different. This is something, but I think, you could see th- that he's enjoying it, and, and and hence the scene where he the first time he meets Guts, Gutman, he breaks the glass and he's like acting all like you know, uh, you know you, you better talk to me and like because he doesn't want to do business with him like you're not going to tell yeah, me what's off very vi- it comes off as it comes very as violent and, and very sort of like all, you know yeah like just short tempered and unhinged and he walks out of it and he starts to laugh he starts to smile but his hand is shaking because of the thrill of it yeah. you know he's like getting off on the on the, on the thrill of this, of this situation, you know, like he's, you know, so yeah, the yeah, adrenaline that, a, is going. That's a very know. important scene for another reason. Mm-hmm. So it, when, when, when Bogart meets Gutman for the first time and, and leaves that apartment after that outburst, right. And he goes up to the elevator and he sees his handshaking. This is the first, this is actually the first scene where we get more information than Bogart because up to this point, we didn't, there was nothing that we were ever told that was, we didn't know anything more than him. We were we were mm-hmm. with him on this journey. We only found out what he found out. That's but right. In that scene, yep. Bogart gets into the elevator. There's two elevators side by side. Bogart gets into one, and the other one is opening, and Joel Cairo gets out. 
and is going to see Casper Gutman. That's That's the first time that we actually find out more. So it's almost like halfway through the film where we don't really, we only know as much as the main character, but now we actually start to see that, you know, there's some other things aligning against him also, uh, which I thought was very interesting. I didn't really Mm -hmm. catch, I was like, oh, well, that's, this is the first time where we really get something, we find out something that the main character didn't, which is, uh, you know, movies that give away too much. I I like to go on the trip with the character. I go in dumb and I don't try and figure stuff out. So I always enjoy that. Um, So it was interesting to see it like halfway through. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, he's he missed that. But now you know to, something. To see it. Now you know. <laughs> now you know. Like, what's he going? Why is he there? Like, what you know? So yeah, like you say, a little bit more of information. The second time he goes to see him, as he's as he's telling him about the Falcon, and he's you know going on and on about, it, and he's telling him how much it's worth. It's probably my favorite line in the film where he says, you know, do you know what this is? Do you have any idea? And he says, you know, well, I I know what it's supposed to look like. And I know the value of human life you people put on it. Like the way, the way he says it so vehemently, like, you know, it's just so, you know, his mood completely changes. But as he's, as, as they're talking, you know, he's, he's smoking the cigar and he's drinking, he keeps filling his glass. And then we come to find out that he, he slipped him a Mickey. He put, Mm -hmm. he drug, he drugs Bogart. I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, I just watched it the other night and it occurred to me, I mean, not to give too much away at this point, because I don't think we got there yet, but it occurred to me as to why I never understood why he drugs him at this point rather than just outright kill him. Yeah. Well, he said it. I mean, he said it later. I mean, cause it, cause it, you know, Gutman isn't really that guy. I don't think like he, he has other mm-hmm. people do, do his bidding, but I, I think, I think maybe from their it's point kind of, of view, baffling because when you consider that they, it's, it's it, cause he can, when you consider that Wilmer, who's the gunsel had no compunction about killing this other character that we know we never mm-hmm. see, this Floyd Thursby kills but him. He, he always does the bidding. He, he kills, does the, you know of Gutman, and you see what later on he does Gutman the dirty waves work. Him off. Yeah, but yeah. Gutman waves him off. So I think, I, I think that was at the behest of Gutman. Is like you know what we don't need this. You know we we got what we needed. We're just going to move on, and and we'll probably be gone anyway. They they thought at that point they were they were going to be making off with it anyway. So it's like what well you know, let's why let's 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 talk a little bit more about the the, you know, the plot, and then we'll get back to that because I I have I mean because you know, I don't know I, I it's <laughs> it, you know I'm I'm kind of is it a plot hole I, I don't know I don't think so because because he you said know, but, it early he goes why did you I mean later on he's he 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 said well. Oh, so that's why you slipped me the Mickey because, uh, you know, they. Yeah, but he says he he tells him he goes, I, we had no we had no room for you in our plan. Yeah. But the but what but it's what you find out at that point, which is important. We and let's get to that. Let's okay. let's talk a little bit more about. So, the plot so yeah, then. well, I mean, pre- pretty much, you know, Spade wakes up and and kind of has a you know <laughs> a big bump on his head, kind of tosses tosses the the room trying to find stuff out get any type of a clue as to where these people went because he wakes up much later mm-hmm. finds out that they that, that there's this ship that came in it was in the newspaper it was circled he get, he gets there just as the the thing is in flames <laughs> yeah. um so so not, not he doesn't get much information there he was you know kind of trying to figure stuff out goes back to his office and that's when someone comes in who's been who's been fatally wounded carrying a, a carrying a, a bundle carrying a package and and gives it to him and says one word right falcon mm-hmm. and that's falcon. that that person is you uncredited know. is um is is john houston's father walter houston un- uncredited it's walter houston that's right yeah it's walter right. houston yep yeah literally, literally in yep. it for like two, two seconds he staggers in <laughs> drops that's off right. the bundle yep. and dies on the dies on the couch <laughs> So Walter Houston was a, was a really big, really famous actor back then as well. Um, so we come to find out that this guy is the captain of the Jack ship. Jackie. Okay, so he has the Falcon. Okay, how? Where? Why? How does this happen now? Now a little, little more information now it is being revealed. Bogart actually has the Falcon at this point. He has it in his hand. He's, you know, he's, and now he's all what do we do now? Cause he's he, in, a, in a way he's kind of unnerved. Cause he's like, he doesn't, this is like the scary part. He's like, I, I, you know, we actually have this thing. People are going to come looking for this thing. Yeah. Well, there so is he, a, there is one point I, I want to point out too, though. There is one point that gets, he, he almost gets overcome with the mania and the greed when they, when they, yes. when they get that, that bundle and his secretary Effie is there. 
We got um, it, and, and, and yep. that we got it, and and he's kind of he doesn't open it all the way. He kind of makes a hole in it and kind of puts his hand in and feels it. His other hand is is grabbing. He's holding Effie's arm, and she's like, you know, Sam, you're hurting me because he's like squeezing it. So, like yep. like there's that almost that look of 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 lust in his eyes. Like Avarice. I have it, yep. I, have right. it I have now. it now. Um, and then then he kind of you know kind of comes kind of comes around and, and kind of you know. Uh, so, which is which is important. Which, which, his senses comes to his senses. Is it because he physically has the bird, or does he have the upper hand at this point? I think it's because he had. I think because he had because of everything he was told and the, and the amount of money they were talking about. I think because because the fact that she says, "Sam, you're hurting me." He's, he's squeezing her her arm so hard that uh, you know because he's always been. He's like the one thing about Spade and is is his relationship with Effie. Mm-hmm. Is is always it almost seems like she's kind of in love with him or would be in love with him, but he only ever sees her as you know, he's you know, like his girl Friday. As you know, yeah, as much. as yeah. the secretary, yeah. but he I mean he asks her to do like crazy stuff and just just yeah. puts her in danger as well, but but knows he can rely on her. I mean, she she's pretty much the only constant in his life and she's always there. Um so I think mm-hmm. that by him doing that, he was almost caught up in like, you know, we we got it. We actually have this thing, and and uh, it almost looks but, for uh, a moment. But like up to was... this point, we it's interesting. To, it's interesting to note that he he went to see Gutman saying that he has the Falcon, knows where it is, but he he didn't though. He, he didn't. really, you know, we, we we really the only the only thing he had was 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 Mary Astor. Yeah, was Bridget O'Shaughnessy, which really she wasn't telling him anything. Right, he didn't know exactly where the bird was. You know, you come to find out that it was being brought to her by this this captain on the ship right and this is where this is where my 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 problem is at this point because they knew they knew about the ship they knew about the bird being come you know so in a sense they had the upper hand they knew more than bogart did at this point so that's my question is why not kill him at this point get rid of him since well, they, they already... don't exactly say when. I mean, they <clears throat> they allude to it later in the film, right? Because because that's when uh, when Gutman says, "Oh, uh, Joel Cairo was looking in the paper and he recognized the name of the ship." So we don't know that that didn't happen before, or at, we don't know exactly when that that may have happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, and and I think I think m- my assumption is that they're thinking of of Sam Spade as just this guy on the periphery. Like we don't need to to kill him. He's not really like that type of a threat. Cause like I said, at that point they thought they were getting the bird and leaving anyway. So that was like, they slipped yeah. in the Mickey. They, but, they, they kicked him in the face. That 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 but that's the thing. It's like, like Wilmer, he's like spades always given Wilmer shit, right? He's always yeah. like, he's always given him. He's like, he's ready to kill him. I would, I, <laughs> It's surprising keeps, to me that he didn't put a bullet in him. He just keeps, well, you know, he, well, that's the thing. He's, like, at, he's at the beck and call of, of Casper Gutman. So Gu- Gutman had waved him off a, right. a few times. And my, so I don't, I, I don't, or I it think could be I, that he has a respect for Spade. Cause he does say like later on, he goes, you're a man of, of, of resourcefulness and I could right. use a man like you on my, in my or, team. Or so that Gutman could just be doesn't too, want that stuff going course, on no. in, in front of him or around him. It's like, you know, cause he just seems like he's, but, he's yeah. detached from it. He doesn't seem like he's the violent guy. He, he will, you know, compel other people to do that for him. So it's just kind of like, yeah, he kind of gets mm-hmm. his hat and they kind of, they kind of leave, you know, they kind of, well, yeah, we're going to go get the Falcon. So, <laughs> um, so basically, yeah. So yeah. Spade's got, Spade's got it. He's, he's got to figure out now, now it's time to, hopefully tie some of these these loose ends together so he just kind of g- gets the falcon basically stows it away he's he's sent on a wild goose chase uh they you know he thinks that mary esther's character is in trouble but that turned out to be a, a red herring as well she was compelled to do that to so so he could leave because they they knew that the guy had had gone to the office with the falcon and they were going to get it but it was already gone by then so basically they come back to uh, his apartment, uh, you know, B- Bogart comes back with Mary Astor to his apartment after all this, and Gutman, Joel Cairo, and and Wilmer Cook are waiting. And they're all waiting for him. They're all waiting That's for right. him. And and uh, you know, he he takes the Falcon and he 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 deposits it in a a post you know a post box at the what is it the train station yeah, or like the a bus, bus station like a whatever. package handling area for like a bus depot or something yeah yeah like a check kind of and he, and he, and he checks he, it so he keep, you know <laughs> he, he checks it so that it's it, it's in hiding you know so he knows exactly where it's at 
And he goes back to his apartment and they're all waiting for him. And yeah. And, and we, we yeah. can't, we can't go through this whole scene, but it's probably the highlight of the film is you've got all these characters in one room. Now, finally, mm -hmm. like you've got everybody that, that is a major player in this film, Bogart managing Mary Astor, managing Gutman, managing Joel Cairo and managing Wilmer all at the same time, like just, and, and sometimes playing certain characters against each other, to 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 kind of take one off the board right to take one off the table it's just some masterful writing i mean it's just and and none of it sounds none of it seems far fetched either because these people are just so yeah. so like in that level of betraying each other and backstabbing that it, you really don't think twice that that these people would do it it doesn't seem so so far fetched to me uh, mm -hmm. there's just so so many and it's great like you say with there. the faces there's just so much there's yeah. so much going on in this one in this scene in this sort of climactic uh, confrontation. Yeah. There's just the, the watch everybody's eyes, watch everybody's facial expression. Yeah, Cause this there's is so where you, much where you, happening there. This is, yeah, you know? this is where you get to Bogart kind of saying, okay, I have the Falcon. Let's do the money. Uh, we need a fall guy. I need to find out the whole story. Like this is really where everything is, is trying to, he's trying to tie up everything. Cause he's got everybody in one room. <laughs> so That's he's, right. he's yep. he just wants to get, he, at this point he does want to just kind of get rid of it and get his money, but, but not really because he's been, you know, he's had that ulterior motive of, of, he still hasn't forgotten that someone killed his partner in the beginning too. And, and that's good. And that this, will, that will ultimately, come back, uh, come back yes. to it where, that we we kind of forget because there's so many other things. A couple of other people get killed on the way, so you really you you get caught up in the story of the Falcon, but you really forget what the what the primary driver of it was is that his partner was killed, and he was trying to investigate that and figure out what that was. That's right. All these other like all these other things kind of happened to him, like this this case kind of happened to him with with the arrival of Joel Cairo and talking about the bird, and he didn't know anything about it, and and kind and of bluffed his way through it. To, to, to this point. And it's like you say, it's like he gets caught up in it and you think that he's going to like, he's in, now he's involved. Now he's with these people. He's just as, just as greedy and just, he wants it for himself. And you really don't know his, his intentions at this point. Like, yeah. Cause they've made all the arrangements. Sense. They, they, yeah. they've, they've kind of worked out the, most of the finances. He's, he's taken some money for it. He's taken That's his right. advance payment on he's it. Promised more um, money. <laughs> they're, they're all kind of waiting. They, they decided, yeah. they decided that Wilmer, is you know someone has to go to the cops like the cops have to have somebody mm -hmm. um so they they eventually decide that Wilmer is going to be the one another great quote comes from from there uh about you know uh, you, uh, you know you've been like a son to me but uh you can always get a, you can always get another son but there's only one Maltese falcon which is <laughs> it's like wow nice i thought it was your son <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> it's like you know you know well you can always get another son but there's only one Maltese falcon so i'm like wow that's just because harsh. yeah because bogart <laughs> needs they one of the one of the things that he wanted to, to get the police off their back was they needed a fall guy at this yeah. point they needed to, to sacrifice literally sacrifice somebody to take yep. the rap for all the murders and you know that kind of and he actually did the killing so it was an ease for him it was a no-brainer but there, there's this whole big thing and then and then it just it just the greed just gets to him he's like yeah we he's he, we don't need him he's a <laughs> Yeah, he's, Just, you know, he's, he's, he's turns expendable. Out to be exactly. That's right. Because because the, the Falcon is is now finally within Casper Gutman's grasp. And that's right. And, he, and, and Bogart makes the call. You know, they, they, they decide to everybody should stay with each other until this is done. And, and daylight comes. Um, so Bogart calls Effie, you know, his his secretary and, and tells her where, you know, what to do. Go to the post, you know, go to our box, get the envelope and and get the package. This is literally a scene. We're watching a scene where they're sitting around drinking coffee, waiting for the sun to come reading up. Reading a book. Yeah. It's Gutman's so reading a book, you know, uh, someone's like, sleeping. It's so like, natural, you know. but we're all, we're yeah. literally sitting on the edge of our seats waiting for what's going to happen at this yeah. point. And right? we're, in just, room. we're, we're in the such room a, with them. You know, we, we are in that room right. with them. Like while yeah. they're, while they're, it's like, yeah. we have a, we have a spot in that room because the camera doesn't, doesn't move. The camera doesn't really get like reverse angles and, and back and, you know, like that kind of stuff, which is kind of interesting. It kind of puts us in the room and doesn't really mm -hmm. move. It, it does close ups, but it doesn't do any reverse angles for the most part or, or at all. Like you never see anything over Joel Cairo's shoulder, what his point of view is. Everything is kind of put out uh, almost like a stage production at this point. On where, display. Yep. where It's like a set. Yep. 
and mm-hmm. and we have our place that we're sitting in in that room and then everything happens it, you know for 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 the most part there are a lot of close ups and stuff but not a lot of like reverse angles yeah. um so the package comes and they 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 get it uh on the table they they're clearing stuff off the table like crazy like they're you throwing the, everything the off the table it's like, like shh, shh, shh. <laughs> yeah they're just like clearing this thing off and and they 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 put this thing on the table it makes like a thud it's like Doo. it's um, heavy yeah. now something i something i noticed on on my last watching is that <clears throat> now how they set the, how they set the shot up is bogart is is standing on one side of the you know they have this desk or this table and Bogart is standing on one side closest to the camera. Yeah. And then what you have on the other side of the table is Joel Cairo, Mary Astor's character, Bridget O'Shaughnessy, <clears throat> and Casper Gutman, which which is that table is is kind of kind of telegraphing. It's creating a separation because because Mary Astor is now back on the on the on just standing as as plain as day with the the bad guys. And they're not pushing her away. Like after everything they've been through and, and all the deception, she is the, the three like worst people in the film are all standing together and Bogart's mm-hmm. on the other side of the table, mm-hmm. um, which, which is kind of a little, kind of a little tell, but Gutman rips, rips that, that thing open. And you know, it's, it, they finally, he finally stands it up. And what I didn't notice in the, I never noticed it in the back. I never noticed Wilmer in the back where he actually, you actually see him like, <laughs> in the back and then you see yeah. him kind of moving over. I never, I, I always wonder, I was like, how, how did he, you know, he, it turns out Wilmer like runs out of the, <laughs> he runs out of there because they're all like focused on this. And I never noticed that he was in the back of those scenes. Cause I was so keyed in on the Falcon and, and then That's ripping right. it open That's and, the and he's kind of in the back and he slowly like leaves the frame, like to go, <laughs> to go out the front door. And I never noticed it until like the, my last, That's right. you see him, you see him stir, you see him, you know, getting, becoming awake. And it's like, what, what you know, but he doesn't say anything. And then, yeah, and then he's away. like, he's standing up behind them in that scene. And then he's like, he slowly like leaves to the right. That's right. And, yeah. But I didn't even notice it. I always, I'm like, how did he get out of there? And no one noticed They They show him leaving. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, so they get this, this Falcon upright and, and Casper Gutman takes out like just this little like knife, like a little exacto knife and, and to kind of, cause it's been coated. It, it, the Falcon is encrusted. It, it's gold encrusted with diamonds and, and all this r- jewels, but it's got a black, uh, lacquer lacquer it, coating yeah. on it. Finish, yeah. Um, so he starts cutting away at it to make sure that it's real and he's slicing pieces of, of the Falcon away. And, uh, it, one of the famous lines, it's lead. It's lead. It's a fake. It's a fake. It's a phony. Mm -hmm. So it it turns out that it's that it it is a fake. And you get one of the greatest outbursts in film history from Peter (laughs) Lorre. And if you if and this is the Ren if you want to know where where Ren and Stimpy if if you're a Ren and Stimpy fan from Nickelodeon, Ren and Stimpy are really based on two specific characters. Um, Stimpy the cat is is really based on Larry Fine. Mm-hmm. From the from the Three Stooges, basically that's who that is. And Ren is Peter Lorre in this scene, where he called you know fat bloated idiot stupid like Ren, you, like if you watch Ren and Stimpy, that's where this came from. It came from this scene. You um, stupid fathead, you. <laughs> you you bungled you bungled it you you, you know you, just he, you and bloated he just, idiot. <laughs> and then and then he just kind of turns around and starts crying and goes like and goes like and like cries on the seat. That's it's right. just like it's just like such a. Uh, he's like a child. He's you like know? a child, and, yeah. and Gutman isn't really affected. Like Gutman's like whatever. Like okay, he's like okay, like he recovers pretty quickly. Gutman's That's right. like all right. Um, this isn't the first time. This isn't the first. Yeah, you know, he, upset. He's, he he's you know. he, for him this is a marathon and not a sprint. He mm-hmm. he's like okay this is just another road bump on the way. You know we got to go to Istanbul. You know we got to get going there then and that's that's where we need to we need to find the guy that originally had it because obviously he made this fake so he has the original one and that's when Gutman in, <laughs> invites you know Bogart Sam Spade he's like you know we could we could use a man of of your abilities with us. Would you like to undertake the Istanbul expedition? Like, no. <laughs> which sounds exciting in, in and of itself it sounds yeah. like you know the istanbul expedition i'm like and wow he takes, like and, he, and, and, and it's point it's interesting to point out that of course he takes the money back at gunpoint <laughs> he takes the money that he gave to bogart bogart takes one thousand dollars out of out of it he's like this will cover my time and expenses and, yes and that's and a that great was, scene you know, too because yeah. you, you never see sydney greenstreet has always been a man of just words and mm-hmm. and verbal sparring and that's the great thing is bogart can 
can do the, the, the physical stuff when he's kind of subduing Wilmer Cook, but he can also verbally spar with, with uh, Sidney Greenstreet, with Casper Gutman. And that's what, Green, that's what Gutman really appreciates about him. But you see one of the great scenes here when, when he does, you know, uh, Gutman says, you know, I, I'm going to need that $10,000 back. And Bogart's like, well, you know, no, that's, that's your problem. I, I did what I was supposed to do. And there's that, just that one f- like like flip with his hands like he he puts his derby on with one hand and lifts up a, a gun hand with the other like yeah. in one shot like in one shot he's like putting his hat on it's and like his where other hand has a gun and says i'll t- i'll take you know you'll give me the whole thing it's i just like, love that it's that sleight of switch. hand it's yeah like you're watching you watching him put his hat on but then the, you know and he's got the gun, gun. Just, that's right yeah, and then the other yep. hand has the gun it's just so just so brilliant like yeah just, just these all these little things make up something bigger it's just these little pieces of, of those little motions and and the looks and and some of the uh, a smirk or all these just make up for for the whole thing so so the three well gutman uh, wilmer's on on the run so gutman and cairo decide to undertake the uh the istanbul expedition so they and he says you know kind of gutman kind of leaves like gives a wave like ta-ta like we're we're heading out and then uh, he get, and he and he tells nothing ever for, happened and, and for you miss o'shaughnessy i'll leave you the fake bird you can have the <laughs> Yeah, so they the leave. Poor they, thing they leave it through behind. Hell. Yeah, so, so you, that, you know. So now they're they're out of there, and now we're really coming to the the true climax of the film. So this how you kind of get two climaxes. You get the climax of the the Falcon story, and you get the climax of of those characters of Gutman and Cairo, and 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 what they're going to do. Now it's time to really tie up the the end of the movie and, and the avenge his his uh, his partner's death. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, he really goes in and, and confronts, uh, Mary Astor's character and she, you know, she tries to lie her way through again and, and there's no time for this. Now he's really in, 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 in really high pressure mode. Mm-hmm. You know, the cops are coming. He's obviously not going to get the bird. The money is gone. So it's, it's time just to kind of finish the whole thing out. Um, and he and literally has minutes just to, to just, yeah. to figure this out, to, to just come, you know, to reveal everything that he knows that he's been, like you say, he's been taking it all in this whole time, reading everybody, gathering information. Yeah. And it just comes out in a flood, like a yeah, flood. And, and, you know? and, and again, from the beginning, he's known that she was a liar and, and he, he knew all this going in, but still has feelings for her. That comes to a head also because what, what makes him decide not to help her is that he, he acknowledges that to her. He, he said, you know, you, you banked on that. You banked on me falling in love with you, just like, and I'm not going to walk in the shoes of all these other people that you yeah. did this to. And and if you get away, and if I let you get away with this, you're going to have, you know, I I don't know that you're ever not going to shoot me, you mm-hmm. know, or that I've got something on you that, that you're going to try and, do, you know, do me in or whatever. So he really does kind of rationalize it. And then he says, you know, on the other hand, you know, I might love you and you might love me like that, you know. But it's not really a not really a decision for him. It, it's you know he doesn't seem too conflicted. And then he one of the famous quotes in this you know in this movie is you know someone kills your partner you got to do something about it you know bad for business bad all around. So there's just so many iconic quotes in this movie. There's there's an interesting that's interesting to me is that there is a uh, there's there's a brotherhood between detectives and it's like you know the police force and so even with private detectives there's a code. That you don't his line you don't cross. I mean, yeah, he could sleep with his wife. He could do it. <laughs> there's all this other dirty handed stuff. But at the end of the day, they do need to stick together in a in a situation. And if one gets killed, you got to find out why. And it's yeah. it's important because it is b- bad for business. It is bad. You don't want a bad reputation in this business. Bad for business. So, bad all right. around. That's right. Yeah. And this comes from Dashiell Hammond, who as a Pinkerton, this is where that reality comes into play. Yeah. So yeah. He pretty much, uh, I, I, he actually, he called, he had called the cops and said, Hey, you know, the, these are the people you got to look up, look out for. And he also did give Wilmer cook some props there because he said, you know, watch out when you go up against the kid. And then the, you know, the, uh, Tom, the, the detective said something on the phone, which you don't hear, but then Bogart says, very, mm-hmm. I'm thinking that Tom said, was, is he dangerous? And yeah. Bogart said, very, because Wil- Wilmer did kill, he killed two people and he, set a, a ship on fire. <laughs> so even though, even though Bogart makes short, even though Bogart makes like short work of him, uh, it doesn't mean that this guy's not a psycho. Cause he is kind of a psycho. Yeah. So he's just warning him. Hey, listen, when you go up against this guy, just be careful. You know, I, maybe he got lucky. Maybe Bogart got lucky. So anyway, 
So they they get they, those those three do get rounded up. We hear about that off screen that you got them. Yeah, we got them. So they caught them. Um, and now they and then and then Bogart says, "Here's one more for you," mm-hmm. and and, right. and gives up, gives her up. And uh, he he actually gets her jacket, but gives it to the detective. He does not put the jacket on her. He he the cop puts her fur or whatever over her shoulders. Um, yeah, because he won't and, he won't give her that. That last, and she doesn't even look at him. She doesn't even from that point on. She actually doesn't even look at him anymore. Um, and I think that goes to her, her cold heartedness too. Is that you know what she you know this was the one that she couldn't break, like couldn't get to bend to her will. Um, almost, almost in shock. Like I can't believe it because all these other you know was, this is basically how I lived my life. Um, so then grab uh, Sam grabs the grabs the falcon off the table. They bring out. Another. This is another classic. Uh, classic ending line is Mary. You know, Mary Esther goes into the into the elevator and they bring her down, and uh, and Bogart is with uh, with Tom Polhouse, the other detective, and he and Tom's like, you know, what is that? This was a line that Bogart himself improvised. He he took it from The Tempest from Shakespeare, and it's the stuff that dreams are made of. Stuff that and dreams are interest- made of. interestingly enough, that is not the last word spoken in the film it's pole house says huh that is the actual the last <laughs> bit of dialogue what <laughs> which to me says everything like huh what what are you talking about like this, uh, to me it just the whole this whole mess is like it's summed up in that one little reaction from this befuddled detective you know he's the what yeah because he he you know? had no he had no inkling <clears throat> as to everything that right. happened all, all this to, to the cops all it was was his part, you know, Bogart's partner was murdered. I mean, that's what they were in, really investigating for the most part. And then the murder of, of, of Floyd Thursby. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, things escalated from there, but this whole other subplot of the bird and the Falcon, you know, Bogart was managing that on his own because he needed to keep the cops away so he could get that figured out because he didn't want the cops getting involved in that and bungling it or just making it worse for him. So right. yeah, there's this whole other thing. Like he, he's keeping the cops at arm's length while he's dealing with this whole other like strange situation. And it's funny in the very beginning of the film, there's like a crawl and it talks about the Falcon, yeah. right? In the very beginning. And it says at the, I think the last line of it is, is, and they tell you the story right there. They said, I think it says, and no one knows its whereabouts. Yeah, it remains a mystery to this Remains day. a mystery. Yeah. They they told you right there. Like it's still they basically gave the film away in the beginning and said mm-hmm. it remains a mystery because you thought you were gonna it was gonna get resolved, this mystery, and it actually doesn't. It's but that's the thing. It's like, do you want you start to wonder, does it even does it exist at all? I always Has thought you know, well, you know? honestly, <clears throat> my my opinion, I always thought that it, that in in my mind that that actually was the Falcon and that it was it was under there. And that because mm-hmm. they, they said about how many times it got like a lacquer coat and Blackstone or whatever. Like, I was thinking, well, it, what if that's they have it and they don't even realize? And they just thought that, you know, because it, he cut through and he didn't get to maybe he didn't go down far enough that it was there. That could you know? be. So yeah. that was always my thing was I always thought, well, wouldn't it be ironic if, if, if it was actually that? If it was, they did have it, but they didn't realize it because they just thought it was fake. Yeah, so, it's, 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 to, to me, me, it's like, it's, I, I think it could be just that classic metaphor for we're just chasing dreams that, yeah. and it just never comes true. And it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's classic, classic red and, herring, right? And we're, and we're willing to do, you know, step on each other and do these nasty deeds to one another. And it's, it shows the humanity or lack of, I should say, you know, just for this, for this thing, you know, and, and it's, well, it plays well. I, this is a movie that I think would play well, very well today because it is so cynical. And so like it's, you know, looking at life, you know, and we've become as a society so much more cynical today that I think this movie play would, you know, would play very well today as opposed to something like Casablanca, which is a bit more sort of patriotic and more mm-hmm. sentimental, you know, kind of thing. So I, I think it, I think it plays well too, just because of the the breakneck pace that it's at too. It's not like a it's not one of those melodramas from the forties. It's it's kind of right. it, it it start. I mean, the movie starts and it doesn't stop. Like I said, there's no there's no you really don't have time to breathe. There's no scene of just him sitting there, mm-hmm. you know, drinking drinking a, a scotch and reading the newspaper. Like mm-hmm. There's there's it, one thing happens and it gets you out and you get some information. He goes to another scene. 
it gives you a, a different perspective on something or something else that he's managing and you get out of that scene. And then he goes into, it goes into the next. There's not wasted lines in this film. Everything, you know, a place for everything and everything in its place in this film. It's right? a testament There's, to John Huston. He, he's yeah. very, very, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. Very, you know, this guy was a, is one of those breed of directors who was, who live, who was larger than life anyway. He was very much like Marion Cooper. And mm -hmm. these guys, these guys were like, they fought in wars. They, they were all over the, they went to Africa. They did this. They were, they were pilots. They were, you know, whatever. So living life to the fullest and, and, you know, working hard and playing hard is what they did. And they, yep. you know, heavy drinker, smoker, all this stuff, but a very intelligent man, a very yep. learned man, a very, uh, uh, well-read man because a lot of his films would be adaptations of literature and yeah, not i mean not big big literature like you know moby dick might have been the biggest mm -hmm. you know but like books that were just these odd little stories like the treasure of the sierra madre yeah. and the african queen he would direct those classics too that's right mm -hmm. and then and then he would do my uh my favorite role it was it was an acting role he was the lawgiver in battle for the planet of the apes that's right he was <laughs> <laughs> and he was also the voice of Gandalf in the Lord in, of the Rings. In the Lord of the Rings, yeah. the the uh, the Ralph Bakshi. Yeah. That's right. And, yeah. But he was yes, he was the lawgiver at the very end of Battle uh, of the Planet of the Apes. He he kind of finished out the story there. So um, just to, just to tie this up, there is a relatively recent film that when I saw it, it had Maltese Falcon written all over it. So if you want to see kind of a modern version of it. Um, the, uh, I didn't pull it up, so I don't know what year it's from, but it's very easily found. It's called Brick. Mm -hmm. I think it came out in like, who was it? Two thousand two, two. I think that far away. I think so. So yeah. it was uh, Ryan Johnson, who now is is much maligned for re for directing uh, Last Jedi in the Star Wars saga. Um, this was like his first film, and if you if you want to see like a, a modern adaptation of Maltese Falcon. Go check out Brick. It's got the same type of snappy dialogue. Uh, the, the structure is very much the same. Multi, you know, like the, even even to the Wilmer Cook character, they got this and guy they, that's just a psycho, just keeps punching people. And, and they reference Maltese Falcon as well. They they actually actually talk about the film in the, in, in this movie. Yeah, so it definitely it's, wears its heart odd. on its sleeve and its and its influence. When I watched it, I'm like, oh my god, does anybody realize that this is the Maltese Falcon? Like, I didn't think people got it because it, it takes place in a high. It's a high school. It high takes, school movie. It's seen through the eyes of high school kids. Yeah, it's almost it's like bizarre. It's, it's almost like Encyclopedia <laughs> Brown meets Maltese Falcon, right? And That's get, right. And you get Brick. It's That's like right. high school, he's like a high school detective, and he, he, you know, there's this under underbelly of of criminal activity, and he's working it, and he's trying to keep the. In this case, he's trying to keep the principal at bay instead of the police. He's like, you know, feeding stuff to the principal, and and he's got this person that gets information for it. Just really well done. So if you want to see something kind of recent. Check that out, but mm -hmm. oh man! But the influence—the influence of this movie is unparalleled. It, 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 is, it is. It has been. It has been referenced. It has been copied. It has been to to no end. I mean, you know, every film the war after. I mean, there's been, and there's been some great ones. You know, I, I Big Sleep and and Asphalt Jungle, which Houston also directed. Uh, but but this, I don't know. It kind of set the standard, and I don't think there's ever been a film quite like it. And just, it's just like you say, it's perfect. It's perfection. In it my is. Book. It's, you know, so it is, it's, it's an easy, it's an easy watch and you just get, you just get drawn in because it's not, it's not over the, there's not really, maybe Mary Astor comes closest to really over the top acting, but every, but everything else just kind of fits. And it's got that mysterious, you know, it's just got that, that smoky look to it. And, mm. and, you know, everything's always, it's always dark out for the most part. There's a couple scenes in, in, during the day, but for the most part, things are happening at night or like Eric said, indoors. So you don't get a, you, it's hard to get a feeling for how much time is elapsing. They, they make, they talk about it brief. They'll say a, a day or two ago or night or the, the morning before, but, but it, it keeps you uh, disoriented in that way too, that you, you're not sure what what's how much time is passing when this is happening because everything is happening so quick. I think in the book it takes place in a matter of a week, I do believe. And it yeah. it's 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 like 1929 or something like that. So obviously it's a different time frame as well. Yeah. But uh but yeah, it's 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 a bona fide classic. It is the it defines the word classic in my book as far as, you know, um 
Absolutely. So, 80, yep. 80, 80 years young. 80 years young this, this year. That's right. So absolutely see this film. You, you have to, you have to see this film. Mm -hmm. That's all we can say about it. And, and then, you know, I mean, if you want to, if you want a nice double feature, you're not going to go wrong with this in Casablanca. Cause you're going to get just two, you know, we'll get, we'll, I'm sure we'll get to Casablanca somewhere down the road. We need to come down. We need to come down from Maltese Falcon and like kind of calm down and get the blood pressure normalized do some do some music episodes and then we'll we could we could go to to Casablanca. Look it's, look it's, this film up on any 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 uh, every critic will love it. It's it's a hundred. It scored a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. It is uh, every critic loved it. It is it is widely considered to be the, one of the greatest films of all time. Yeah, this is yeah. Uh, absolutely one for the ages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We I, I think hopefully we've sold. Hopefully we didn't go too far off the rails. Hopefully it made some sense. Uh, enough sense that you'll want to go check it out, but you're, yeah, you're not going to get, uh, dialogue, uh, cinematography acting. It, it's all there and, and you're getting some, uh, heavyweights literally in, in Sydney green street, but heavyweights also in, uh, in Humphrey Bogart. This, this really shot him out of the rocket. He was a bit player before this, for the most part, mm -hmm. the, you want to see a star making performance. It, it's this one. It's Maltese Falcon. That's going to do it for us. For the 3324 podcast, we thank you as always for taking the trip with us. You'll be able to find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram at 3324podcast. Uh, you've been hanging out with Eric and you've been hanging out with Dean. Uh, we appreciate it. And always, we always ask that you just please be kind and rewind. You've been listening to the 3324 podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important, so make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 